Hi, WorkWell listeners. I'm really excited to share that my book, Work Better Together, is officially out. Conversations with WorkWell guests and feedback from listeners like you inspired this book. It's all about how to create a more human-centered workplace. And as we return to the office for many of us, this book can help you move forward into post-pandemic life with strategies and tools to strengthen your relationships and focus on your well-being. It's available now from your favorite book retailer. Time is a precious resource, yet we live in a culture that constantly makes us feel like we never have enough of it. With only 24 hours in a day, how can we make sure we're spending it on the things that matter and that give us joy? This is the WorkWell podcast series, bringing you a special mini series from the 2023 World Happiness Summit. Hi, I'm Jen Fisher, Chief Wellbeing Officer for Deloitte, and I'm so pleased to be with you today to talk about all things well-being. I'm here with Cassie Holmes. She's an award-winning teacher and researcher of time and happiness. She's also a professor of marketing and behavioral decision-making at UCLA's Anderson School of Management, and she's the best-selling author of the book, Happier Hour. Cassie, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Jen. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have this conversation. So let's start. How did you become passionate about researching time and happiness? I feel like those things are often at odds with one another. <laughs> yeah. And that's probably exactly why I started um, researching this because I um I found that for my happiness, and by that I mean the sort of emotion that I was experiencing in my day, as well as the satisfaction felt about my life, um, my biggest challenge was time. Mm. And uh, and I had a really actually unhappy relationship with time. And it's sort of, I, I share a story um, to open the book that I think many can relate to. And it, it's, it was sort of like, Earlier in my career, um, when I was an assistant professor at Wharton, it was just like one of these like crazy hectic days, which so many of us have, and like all of my days feel crazy and hectic. But this one I remember quite vividly because it was poignant. Um, and it was I had gone up from Philly to New York to give a talk, and it was sort of squished between back to back meetings. And then I'm rushing to this colleague dinner, and then rushing. Um, to the train station and in a New York City cab, which, as we know, they already are driving fast. And I'm not someone you, who yells. And here I was yelling at this man to drive faster because I could not miss the last train that would get me home to my four-month-old and my husband who are asleep in Philly. And I like, I didn't make the train, but I was like looking out the window and I was like, as everything was rushing by, I was like, I don't know if I can keep up, right? Between the pressures of work, wanting to be a good parent, wanting to be a good partner, wanting to be a good friend, the never ending pile of chores. I was like, I just don't have enough hours in the day to get it all done, let alone to do any of it well, let alone to enjoy any of it along the way. And so it was that feeling of like where I was actually considering, I was like, I think the only solution is to quit, to quit my job that led me, <laughs> I did not quit my job. And instead I actually started dedicating myself to figuring out how do I slash we invest our hours so that um, our time is not, our biggest challenge, but can be the solution to greater happiness. And I can't wait to have this conversation because I feel like I have a lot to learn. Um, <laughs> that, you know, the story that you just told, I, I mean, it's just, it's one that in one way or another, all of us can relate to, especially in today's world. So um, let's let's dive right in. And, and I know in the book you talk about you know, that we live in this culture that keeps us feeling time poor. Um, so can you talk about what that is and why that is? 
Yeah. In our culture, it's like busyness has become like a status symbol, right? It's like, if we're busy, that means that we're needed and important and competent and able and in high demand. And our busyness is something that it's like we're reacting to what seems urgent, irrespective of how important those things are. And in we can sort of distract ourselves from what matters um, by just sort of like moving through the day and getting things done. It's like these to-do lists that we have. And I uh, like, I live almost by mine. And the, the crummy thing is when those to-do lists are not only sort of motivating us to get stuff done, but it's sort of driving us and constantly in the back of our minds such that we're rushing through everything that we're doing and what's on that list not all of it is important, right? And even checking some of those things off can be a way to almost procrastinate from the stuff that really matters. And some of that stuff that really matters is actually not doing a to-do list and sort of carving out time where we're simply being. You know, we give our space, ourselves the space to really connect with the people around us, but also we have technology, like our our smartphones are with us at every second that allow us to Mm -hmm. be getting stuff done at every moment. And even the presence of our phones, even if we're not on them, it's like reminding us of all the other things we could and should be doing, which pulls us out of the moment. I mean, we are distracted. Research shows that we're distracted not thinking about what we're currently doing almost half the time, 47% of the time. And when we are spending time on what is important, (laughs) if we're not even like, if our mind isn't even in it, then we're sort of missing out on that time as well. So again, like time is this big challenge that we have because we wish we had more of it so that we could get more done as well as slow down. But by being more intentional and carving out time for these activities that are important, that are worthwhile, and when we're engaging in those activities, paying attention, um, you actually have really big, like, positive effects. This whole idea of the to-do list and checking, I mean, because I I fall, I don't know if it's victim, but I'm definitely guilty of this where it's like I have my to-do list and I don't necessarily do the things, like you said, the things that are most important or the things that I know I should prioritize, but what I go to are the things that are easiest to check off the list because I feel like that's going to give me some sense of satisfaction that I accomplish something. But often I don't actually feel like I've accomplished something because the big, meaty, hairy, hard things are still on the list. And so I still end up getting really stressed out about them. Totally. Yeah. And I, I am I am subject to this too, or guilty or prone to it as well. And I, I refer to it as productive procrastination, mm-hmm. right? It's like when we have the big, meaty sort of challenging and important um, tasks that are sort of ahead of us, sometimes it is easier. Like we procrastinate by doing these little easy things to check off. I mean, like the, my, you know, email inbox is (laughs) like the most like distracting and it will fill all of the time that I give it. And it gives me a sense that I am getting stuff done. And I, you know, like responding to emails, it is something that I do need to do, but it, it it's not necessarily the important stuff. And the, the problem is with this sort of feeling of time poverty. So when I was saying, you know, that sense that I had on the train that so many of us have of we, I refer, or we refer to in the literature as being time poor. It's that acute feeling of having too much to do and not enough time to do it. And it's, it's really sort of prevalent. Uh, we actually did a national poll that showed that nearly half of Americans feel time poor. And, and as you were saying, it's like all of us feel this way. But it's, it's really 
detrimental because actually the effects of it and like in my research as well as others, when we feel like we don't have enough time, it makes us less healthy. We're less likely to exercise. We uh, delay going to the doctor. It makes us less nice. So we're less likely to slow down and help others out. Uh, It makes us less confident in being able to achieve what we set out to do. And it makes us less happy. Um, And if given the fact that we feel so time poor, if we're filling our time with these sort of (laughs) less important things that can make us feel like we're getting stuff done and we're um, accomplishing. Um, The problem is that it, it sort of derails us from making progress on this stuff that's really important. And then, you know, we're looking back on our weeks and we're like, we were busy, but you don't feel at all satisfied or fulfilled because you haven't actually invested in what does matter, you know, like those pieces of your work that are, are those big meaty like projects that are so important to making progress as well as the relationships in our life, right? Like investing in those people that really matter to us. And when we're so busy and we, you know, are the the relationships (laughs) suffer the most. Yeah. yeah. And this, this sort of idea of like what's urgent versus important, we respond to what seems urgent irrespective of its importance. And unfortunately, relationships, the, those ones that are so important, don't, we don't recognize them as urgent because, you know, they're part of the fabric of our lives. It's our family members. It's like our best friends that, make, you know, have been around we forever. We the that they'll always be there because they've always been there. Yeah. And that is, um, you know, talk about a way to undermine happiness is by not investing in those people. Um, And we can, we can sort of talk about that from lots of different angles. Um, But the role of social connection and carving out and making the time such that we're investing in those things that really matter. So you brought up, you know, this whole idea of what's urgent versus what's important. When it comes to our to-do list, um, I feel like we spend a lot of our time, at least I do, spend a lot of my time, you know, kind of reacting to other, you know, what's on other people's to-do list that's not necessarily even on my to-do list. Yeah. Um, So... It's really important for folks to identify their own purpose. Like, what is it that really drives you? Um, What is that sort of impact, that higher level goal that you have um, in your pursuits? And so in Happier Hour, one of the exercises I share to help people identify their purpose, because it sounds so sort of lofty and, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and mushy and, you know, unattainable, but... Um, it's the five whys exercise and it's the five whys because you're sort of asking and answering five layers of why do you do what you do? Um, and oftentimes the first answer to like, you know, why do you do what you do is the job description that, you know, for me as a business school professor, it's to do research and to teach. But then you ask yourself again, well, why, why is that important? It's like, well, I want to create knowledge and disseminate knowledge. And then asking again, well, why? Why is that important to you? And then in answering five layers of why, you really sort of get at the heart of what drives you. And, and for me, I realized that my what really drives me is creating knowledge about what makes people happy and disseminating knowledge about what makes people happy. And notably, my purpose is distinct from all of my colleagues, you know, and even probably, you know, like the business school. But it's so helpful for me to know what drives me because it allows me to figure out what do I say yes to and what do I say no to. Mm -hmm. Um, you can use it as a filter. And I absolutely do. I use it as a filter for, you know, what is a research project that I will take on? What is like, is it about creating knowledge about what makes people happy? If I'm invited to do an interview or give a talk, 
Is it about disseminating knowledge about what makes people happy? If so, yes, then it's all, I'm absolutely game to do it. But if it's not, then it's a no. Like, you know, the committee work, the, the other projects that are, you know, there's endless opportunities and re requests and asks that we all get, you know, throughout our days. But also, not only does it help identify what to say yes or no to, but it makes some of those unfun features of your job just less onerous. It makes, and it actually makes some of the work like just truly joyful. So it's like, if you know, like the why of your tasks, then it makes it feel better to do it. So like, I hate email, right? But if I'm like responding to a research collaborator and I'm like, oh, this is actually not email. This is about creating knowledge about what makes people happy. Then it's like, oh, this is worthwhile. And that worthwhileness makes it feel more fulfilling. It doesn't feel like such a waste of time, which so many, you know, so many sort of pieces. The thing that's so painful for us is wasting time. When we feel like we've spent minutes or hours on something that was worthless, um, that is very painful. And actually research shows we're more sensitive to wasting time than wasting money because like it can never be regained, right? And so if you know the why of your work, um, then it will, um, it becomes more fun. Uh, so that's to say like by very, being having that clarity as to, as to your purpose, what are your goals? Then that will inform what you, um, what you take on and what is important and not necessarily just what seems urgent and is put on you by others. Well, and, but all of us have things in our jobs that, um, we have to do regardless, right? Yeah. <laughs> whether, regardless totally. of whether or not they're, they're aligned, um, or associated with our purpose. But I think what I hear you saying is that, um, you know, trying to kind of find the, the path to purpose, even if the task at hand isn't specifically related. So like email, you know, so you hate email, but you want to respond to a certain email because it has, you know, that because it, it leads to an opportunity that is important to you, that matters to you. Or um, I, I was kind of thinking about like, okay, well, if there's things that I, I know I have to do just because they're a factor of my job, does that help, you know, like, you know, kind of changing my mindset around that, right? Like if I, I know I have to get, get this done because it's a kind of just something I have to do related to my job, but then that allows me to move on or move forward to, you know, the tasks or the things that actually are much more purposeful or much more meaningful to me. Does that, am I understanding yeah. that correctly? Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, it's, it is understanding like that it sort of fits into your work and like in order for you to make progress on the stuff that matters, that this might be something that is, is a necessary. And so that makes it more worthwhile, but also it, it does clarify like a lot of these things that we think are necessary aren't actually yeah. right. And so it, it does help sort of filter some of that stuff out. So it's like, yes, my email responding to my colleague or uh, my, you know, research collaborator is something that is important to respond to, but, you know, staying up on my inbox, that's actually, you know, as a whole is, is not uh, super important. <laughs> and so it, it does sort of clarify, um, it clarifies that. And then also there are going to be features of your job and our, of our lives. Like if you look at the time tracking research, <laughs> like, what are those activities that we spend our time on that lead to the most happiness and contribute to the least amount of happiness? The least happy activities on average are commuting. So getting to work and back mm -hmm. work hours for the average American and the average work hour and housework. And, but obviously these are things that we have to do. And so for work hours, there is, you know, like understanding the purpose and so that you can be sort of more sort of craft your work such that it is um, more satisfying and fulfilling. But then there's just going to be parts that aren't fun. And so I do share other strategies 
um, bundling is actually a very effective mm-hmm. strategy to make activities that feel like a chore feel less like a chore. And bundling is coming out of research by Katie Milkman and her colleagues where they talk about it as a way to motivate. I talk about it as a way to make hours feel better. So bundling, it's so simple. It's like you take an activity that you have to do that's not fun and you bundle it with another activity that you do enjoy such that that time that you spend then feels more enjoyable. So like commuting Instead of what we generally do is sort of mindlessly, you know, scroll radio stations in the car, or if you're on the subway, scroll social media, if you're actually intentional and like every time you get in the car, turn on an audiobook um, or listen to a podcast, or if you're on the subway, open a book, then all of a sudden, that time you're like learning something and you get to finally read. So in my time poverty research, for instance, I have people complete the sentence. I don't have time to blank. A very frequent answer is I don't have time to read for pleasure. But if every time you got in the car, you turned on an audio book, then, you know, every week mm-hmm. you read, you, know, you get through a book. So you can like, you know, join that book club that you didn't have time to for before, but also work hours. Like, the happiest activities or the time tracking points to our happiest hours as those that are socially connecting, those times that allow us to truly connect, like have those conversations with folks. And if you bundle some of your unfun work with social connection, then all of a sudden that feels more fun. So like in that email you know, like with someone on a project, instead of like that 3 p.m. like trudging through writing the email, like why don't you invite that person and go grab a cup of coffee and it gets you outside, which is a research shows is a mood booster, Mm -hmm. gets you moving and you get that social connection um, that makes all of a sudden, you know, talking about that, the next steps on a project more fun. I love I love all of those ideas, and so you know when when we talk about um, you know time poverty, I mean I think a lot of people would say, well, basically you're just telling me that I need to stop doing so much so I can have more free time. Um, <laughs> so I, I guess what's your you know what's your response to that? Because I feel like people would be like, yeah, it would be nice to stop doing so much, but I I don't have that luxury. Um, yeah, what's sort of Actually, um, maybe funny is my answer to time poverty is actually to not do less, but to do more, to do more of the things that matter to you. So what is time poverty? It's that feeling of not having enough time to do what you want to do. Yeah. Um, And so there, there's a couple ways to address that. One is being very sort of more thoughtful about the to-do list, actually, which is what we were talking about before, like making sure that the important stuff is on that, like, like, like what you set out to do is determined by you and what's important as opposed to others or this sort of general sense that you should be doing something. Um But also it's the confidence in being able to achieve what you set out to do. And so the role of self-efficacy. So one of the things like actually in in my research, we found that spending time to help someone makes people like giving time actually makes you feel like you have more time, Mm -hmm. which is counterintuitive at first, because when we are in a rush, something that we don't do is slow down to help others out. We become actually very stingy with your time, with our time. But we found in uh, experiments that when people actually do help someone out, it makes them feel like they have more time because what happens is you're like, oh my God, I, I accomplished a lot. Like when you've helped someone, you're like, oh my gosh, I accomplished a lot with my time. And then it gives you a sense of how much you can accomplish with your time more generally increasing a sense of time affluence. This also, you can think about this with respect to exercise, right? When I feel like I don't have time, one of the first things that goes is my morning run. But when I make the time to go on my morning run, I'm like, I'm out there and exercise increases 
Like not only does it help offset anxiety and depression, but it increases self-esteem and increases self-efficacy. And I am always like, so like, as I'm, you know, out there in the morning running, all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, bring it on day. I can do <laughs> what I I want to and I need to, and that, that is important for me to do. And, and it increases, it, it sort of lessens that sense of limitation of time and it increases that sense of being able to accomplish what I set out to do. There's also work actually that shows um, awe. So yeah. um, having an experience that evokes awe, oftentimes that can happen from nature or going, you know, and seeing a live performance um, and that feeling of awe uh, expands not only sort of your perspective in general, but also the sense of how much time you have. Um, and so the answer for like time poverty isn't sort of to do less of everything. It's actually to make time for those things that really matter, like exercise, <laughs> like that sort of social connection. Um, and I would even say like carving out carving out and protecting time for that work, that purposeful work um, and, you know, removing the distraction of the phones or email. Um, and that increases a sense of how much you have done and the worthwhileness of it and therefore um, minimizes or lessens that sense of limitation from time poverty. And I love that you brought awe into this because, you know, I think we talk about or if you research awe, actually, we've had, uh, I've had Doc, Dacker Keltner and Joan oh, yeah. Pickett have both been on on the podcast. I know Dacker just came out with his book on awe, which I haven't read yet, but it's on my list. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they talk about awe in terms of something that actually gives you the feeling of expanding time, you know, it makes you feel like you have more time. Or, or, okay. or I guess it could also make you feel really small. <laughs> no, but what it does is it, it, it gives perspective. So yes, it's like you are a piece of this larger whole, but it's this sort of expanding the, the sense that, um, yeah, it, it increases, uh, it gives perspective and that expansion expands the sense of time. Yeah, I love that. So you you brought up um, technology kind of a couple of times, especially in terms of um, distraction, right? And I mm -hmm. think that that's how we, most of us would probably associate <laughs> um, the, the technology in our lives. Um, but is, is there a way to use technology like positively to kind of help alleviate time poverty? Um, well, absolutely. I mean, yes, technology is very effective, like, right? It allows us to do so much at every single moment. It allows us to socially connect. So even research that looks at the role of um, social media on emotional well-being, um, it depends on how you use it. Mm -hmm. So um when, when you're using social media as a way to connect with folks whom you already have relationships with, is it, if it's about like sharing pictures with your family and seeing pictures, you know, of your family and staying connected to those relationships, it, and, you know, like FaceTime so that you are sort of minimizing the physical distance so that you can actually stay connected to the people that you love. Um, that is really powerful. The problem is when it's used passively. So when you are not actively connecting, but you're using it to sort of watch other people's lives, um, it has a really negative effect because um, oftentimes, you know, it's like not an accurate representation of other people's lives. You only see them in their smiley moment. And then it's lots of people. So at every moment, like... <laughs> of your regular day, you are seeing these like perfect moments of other people's days. Um, and so through that social comparison, it can feel quite isolating. Um, and not to mention like this sort of sense of expectation that it sort of creates, as I mentioned before, it's like, since you can be doing anything at every moment, like 
knocking off those to-do lists, like ordering something, you know, ordering your groceries or your kids' school supplies. Um, Since you can be doing that at any moment, then oftentimes we think that we sort of should be. So it's, technology is very useful. Now, the, the thing that you just need to be careful of is that it can fill so much time that um, you need to protect time from it. So I talk about sort of carving out times as no phone zones. So at dinner, you know, like with your family or, you know, going out for drinks with a girlfriend or during the that part of your workday where you actually do want to get into that deeper, meatier work. Um, for me, it was when I was writing the book, I carved out hours that were no phone zones. So minimizing, sort of protecting, you know, my mind space um, from the pings, because what you want to do is get into flow. Mm-hmm. But like what researcher, like, researcher um, Mahali Chick sent me high talks about this flow state. And that is when you're so immersed in what you're doing that you lose your sense of time. Right. And that's like when we're at our best, where they're most creative, most productive, but there's no way we're going to get into flow. If you're like responding to pings or you keep, you know, like getting the temptation to like look at your phone and I'll just quickly respond to this email. Like those distractions keep you from getting into a flow state and in the sort of social context um, research shows there's an interest or sort of cute study conducted by Liz Dunn and her colleagues where it was friends dining together and they randomly assigned um, some folks to put their phones away out of sight. The others could leave their phones on the table like we generally do. And what they found was that those who had put their phones away out of sight um, reported enjoying the dining experience more because they were more engaged. Having the phone on the table made them enjoy the experience less because they were more distracted. And so as we are so busy, if we are going to like spend time on an activity that does matter to us, then carve it out, like protect it, put the phone away so that you're getting the most out of that time. You're spending the time, but you're not getting the fulfillment out of it because of the you know presence of technology. Right. It's like you're sort of missing the time. <laughs> you're, you're you're actually, you're kind of wasting the time, right? <laughs> totally. It's like missing out on that potential happiness, and which is such so critical when we have so little time, right? Does anybody has anybody ever told you, at least initially, that it's it's anxiety producing? <laughs> yeah, all of them. So, like going into it, they're like, "Oh my god, Professor, what are you doing to us?" It's like super stressful going into it, and actually, the first hour is mm-hmm. stressful for many people because it's that sort of habit of like reaching for the phone. What you know, like, who's trying to reach me? What am I missing? Um, and, and then the cadence of the, the six hours is, is, is interesting because it's that first hour where it's still that anxiety and stress. And then on like hour two, that lesson, like that sense of stress, um, sort of dissipates and then people really settle into the experience. And then that's where you get the, the sort of freeing feeling and the power and the, and like, there's a lot of folks that are scared fear, like anxious about like, oh my God, but I have so much I need to get done. Mm -hmm. And, but then what's so interesting is coming out of the digital detox, they were way more productive than, than they would have been otherwise for all the reasons that we were saying before, because, you know, the productive procrastination and that sort of those interruptions that our phones and technology sort of does. But once they freed themselves from that and sort of got that space then they actually dug in and did those those sort of big important things that they'd been procrastinating from and holding off. So they ended up actually more productive um, during that time. And I feel like you're you're like inside of my 
world or inside of my head describing this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, I think we've, we've kind of talked about, um, you know, practical tools or tips um, throughout kind of in terms of the way we can structure or restructure our time. But are there some other kind of specific tips, especially kind of related to our workday or the way that we design and structure our workday that you like to share with people? Yeah. I mean, there's so many, but <laughs> I think one, one that I think uh, is very helpful is time tracking. So this, as, as I was sort of mentioning before, what researchers do to identify what are those sort of activities that are more satisfying versus less. Um, they f- sort of over the course of people's days, see what activity they're doing and how they're feeling. So they can sort of pull out on average, what are those activities that make people most happy and least happy. But that's based off of averages. So like, yes, on average, hours spent working are the least happy. And on average, hours spent socializing are the most happy. But that's like an average person. And, you know, I can absolutely say that there's some of my work hours that are totally joyful. And I can absolutely say that there's sometimes socializing that doesn't feel very fun. (laughs) So what I encourage folks to do is actually to track their own time for a week, writing down and there's uh, like, it's very rudimentary worksheet from my website, but like you can, anyone can write this down. Basically what you're doing is for every half hour writing down what activity are you doing and being more specific than work versus socializing? Like what work task is it? If you're socializing, whom are you with? What are you doing? And as importantly rating on a 10 point scale, how did you feel coming out of it? How satisfied, you know, happy, fulfilling. And admittedly, while it's pretty tedious to do the tracking, it is so worthwhile because at the end of the week, you have this fantastic personalized data set so you can look across your all of your data and be like what are those activities that made me feel the best what are those and then as also like what are some commonalities across those most positive activities so like i found for instance when i did it it was like actually one on one conversations were my source of like happiness whether that's with a family member whether that's like with friends, I like far prefer the one-on-one drink or coffee than the group dinners or cocktail parties. Mm-hmm. But also I realized my one-on-one conversations with colleagues were actually really wonderful too. And while that goes in the work bucket, like it was, it's a great source for me of fulfillment. And I saw that in my data. And so, and I also saw like what work tasks or activities are the good ones versus the bad ones. And then also with this data, you see not just what activities sort of feel the best and worst, but also just how much time you're spending across your various activities. So when my students do this, for instance, going back to the role of social media, a common observation is like, holy cow, Mm. I had no idea I was spending that much time on social media. You know, it's like, they're like, oh, it's only five minutes, I'll check, but those five minutes turn into a half hour. Then those half hours add up to, you know, over 10 hours in a week. And for folks who feel truly time poor, right? Folks who are like, I don't have time to do this stuff that I really want. Meanwhile, they're spending 10 hours on social media. That is like such a source or like watching TV every night. It's this like very easy. And we have this sense of like, oh, like, Social media is my fun time. But then when they look at their ratings, it's like a four, you know, right. out of 10. Or, and, and watching TV, like, it's like that sort of decompressing fun time, or we think of it, but it's like, really, it's that first half hour that's fun, you know, as we're like on hour three of binging every night. And then it's like the fourth night in a row. That's like, oh, wait, actually, these are hours that aren't as fun as I thought they were and can be reallocated to other activities that really are satisfying, like meeting up with a friend for a drink or dinner when we so often feel like we don't have the time. Yeah, I, absolutely. And and those are things that are really seemingly easy to fix, right? <laughs> like it, those, it doesn't, doesn't require like a major overhaul of your life. It's just kind of cutting, it's cutting out 
how much time you spend on social media or cutting out how much time you watch TV. And that should be seemingly pretty easy, pretty easy. Totally. I mean, all of the strategies are give are simple little uh, like tweaks that yeah. have really big effects. Um, and even just seeing your own data for the time tracking, mm-hmm. that will have its own effect because that will be all of a sudden clarifying. And it's not me telling you, you know, like spend less time doing social media, but you looking at your own data and being like, wow, it really doesn't make me all that happy. <laughs> and like, I'm, you know, like, and I, you know, like it, it's such a clear sort of, like I can scoop those that time that is actually being wasted um, because it's not that fun, nor is it important, and reallocate and like open up those hours for you know like going for that morning run because it will make you feel better, or meeting up with your friend um, for a drink because yeah. that will be so fun. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. So w- one more question. Um, I know you've also, in addition to kind of researching, I guess, time and happiness, but you're also researching or you've been researching time and its connection to other things like money and age. So what, like, mm-hmm. are there any interesting insights from your other research that you've that you've learned that you'd like to share? Yeah. So I think that the role of age is really illuminating. Um, And so what we've found is that over the course of people's lives, what makes how they express and experience happiness shifts. So looking at blog day, we looked at like millions of posts when someone wrote, I feel or I'm feeling happy. What are they expressing? And what we found is like younger people tend to experience happiness as excitement. As you get older, it becomes more about sort of calm contentment. Um, and so I think just that recognition, um, is increases like empathy, both for yourself, your future and past self, but also to folks around you who are at different life stages is like, it's not that they are less happy. It's what makes how they experience happiness that shifts. But I think as interesting is we were looking at what's the happiness that we enjoy from extraordinary experiences versus ordinary experiences. So extraordinary experiences being those like once in a lifetime vacations, those life milestones, like, you know, going to a concert or that, you know, super famous restaurant for that fabulous meal versus ordinary experiences like uh, being at the kitchen table with your family or, you know, having a uh, uh, noticing the nature around you, like the sunrise or, you know, a sunset or enjoying a treat, like a glass of wine or a piece of chocolate. We were like, what is the sort of happiness from these various experiences? And what we found is that among younger people, extraordinary experiences produce greater happiness than ordinary experiences. But I think what was more interesting is that among older people, those ordinary experiences produced as much happiness as the extraordinary. That is, as people get older, they start to notice those simple joys more. And But what I think even more interesting is that it's not about age per se. What happens is as we get older, we start recognizing that our time and life is limited and finite. And so it makes us start appreciating all of our time more and we start savoring. So actually among younger people, when they are led to recognize that their time is limited, then they also savor more. They enjoy the joy from those simple pleasures. And I think this is so important because in the craziness of our lives and the hecticness um, of our days, is there is so much happiness that's right there in the time that we're already spending. But so often we don't notice it because, you know, that to-do list is like in our minds or we're on our phones, like planning for thinking about what's next. Um, Also, we're subject to hedonic adaptation. So this is Mm -hmm. our tendency to get used to things over time. So when you do the same thing again and again, when you're with the same person, it stops having the same emotional impact and it's good that we adapt to bad stuff. But when we get used to 
these joys that are right there in our days that such that we're sort of missing out. And we're already spending the time, but we're just missing the happiness that's in the time that we're spending. Um, I share strategies to offset hedonic adaptation, to notice the joys. And so much of it is about just recognizing how precious our time is, realizing, counting, actually, and counting times left um, is an exercise that I encourage folks to do because so often it's if you look at the percentage of your total times of doing these things that you have left, so often it is far fewer than you think. And that recognition makes you realize just how important and that you do carve out the time. You're more likely to make the time for it. But also when you're spending the time, you're more likely to pay attention because you know just how limited and precious and wonderful those moments are. Say like me on a coffee date with my daughter or at the kitchen table at night, you know, with your family um, or when you are on that morning run and, you know, the sun is rising, that there's just so much joy that's in the time that we're already spending. It doesn't require more time. It's just making the most of the time that we have. I love that. And I can't think of a better message to end our time together, although I'm sad that it's coming to an end because I feel like I have at least 10 or 12 more questions for you. So maybe we need a part two. (laughs) But Cassie, thank you so much for being on the on the show today, uh, for sharing your wisdom um, and for anybody that wants to learn more and uh, and follow your work. Um, obviously, they can purchase your book, Happier Hour. But are there any other uh, any other ways that they can follow your great work? Um, well, I don't spend much time on social media <laughs> for all the reasons I said. My website, CassieMHolmes.com. That's where sort of my latest research and where I am. But really, it's all in the book. And I hope that folks can listen to it, too. That's a bundling option you when you're in your car <laughs> to be happier. Love it. Well, thank you again. I'm so grateful Cassie could be with us today to talk about time and happiness. Thank you to our producers, Rivet360, and our listeners. You can find the WorkWell podcast series on Deloitte.com, or you can visit various podcatchers using the keyword WorkWell, all one word, to hear more. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe so you get all of our future episodes. If you have a topic you'd like to hear on the WorkWell podcast series, or maybe a story you would like to share, please reach out to me on LinkedIn. My profile is under the name Jen Fisher, or on Twitter at JenFish23. We're always open to your recommendations and feedback. And of course, if you like what you hear, please share, post, and like this podcast. Thank you and be well. The information, opinions, and recommendations expressed by guests on this Deloitte podcast series are for general information and should not be considered as specific advice or services.